thank you very much for the organizers and you to be here. So let me start quickly with the topic of the course. So <coughs> the idea is to analyze in this first lecture and probably in the next one, what happens with instead of iterating one diffeomorphism, you iterate two of them which commute with each other. Okay, and in the, the idea is to start with the nicest situation. Then later probably if we can, we go and move on to do some more complicated stuff, probably making the group more complicated, but let's start with this simple case. Okay, so to introduce the objects, let me just start with one guy, okay, which I guess a lot of you are more accustomed, so. Have a diffeomorphism f from m to m. In general, m will be a compact manifold, but it could be something different. Diffeomorphism. <coughs> and when we study these guys, there is one notion which is called hyperbolicity, which is very useful to understand them. So there is the ultimate hyperbolicity assumption, which is the Anosov condition. So let me define it. Say F is Anosov if have a splitting into a contracting space and an expanding space of the tangent space of so that so this means in each point M have the invariance condition. Let me just put so this is the first condition, and the second is the contracting and expanding property. Okay, so it's this is lambda less than one positive such that and C positive. That dx fn of b is less than c lambda to the n b for every b s and similar thing but when you go to the past every b in u and n positive so when you go to the future you contract on the stable when you go to the past you contract on the unstable Okay, and the ultimate example of this guy is the matrix. This, which has eigenvalues, lambda, three plus, well, this should be the other guy, lambda plus minus, plus minus square root of five over two. You have the eigenspaces, ES plus U, Associated to these guys, which you can compute quite easily. <coughs> so this is the U guy, this is the EAS gas. Here you, you have the unit cube. This is not supposed to go through this diagonal. This is supposed to go. Uh, okay, let's try again. Taking this guy is supposed to go this way. Okay. So these are the eigenvalues. So this is the one, one, the zero. This is the unstable. This is the stable eigendirection. Okay, so, and since the entries of this <coughs> guy are integers, we can look at it as acting on the torus T2, we just use the same letter for the corresponding guys. So here T2 is R2 mod the integer, so you should take a point plus the integer lattice, it will be mapped to a point plus the same integer lattice, so it goes to this quotient space, and this is just the torus, which is this guy here. So, These spaces, stable and unstable, you can put it just by translating over 
every point on the torus, and you will have your decomposition you are looking for here, and you will have the contraction. You can take the lambda here to be exactly this lambda minus appearing here, okay, which is the contracting guy. And one over lambda minus is exactly the lambda plus, so you get exactly this, this condition, beautiful condition here. Now, this is a good example to understand, and you have a lot of properties, so it has a lot of invariant measures, you have a lot of periodic points. So, for example, you can show that the periodic point of F coincides with the integer points. F is A. The, integer, the, the rational points of, of the torus are exactly the same as, as the periodic point. You can put it as an exercise if you want. It's a simple one. So it's a first exercise. <coughs> Uh, so this already gives you a lot of invariant measure because if you have a periodic orbit, then you can put equal weights, so one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter here, and you have an invariant measure already. Also, the fact that the determinant of this matrix is one makes it this map area preserving. So it's area preserving on R2, and you have the natural area measure on the torus T2 that is also preserved. Okay, so this is also nice. <coughs> you can prove ergodicity of the area measure using Fourier analysis, which is very useful. We are going to discuss very little of it later. Not for this map, but for a little bit more general than this. So higher dimensional analogs of this. But one problem that it has is the following. This is the second exercise, which says that if B is here, so these are integer matrices determinant one. So I have another such matrix here, and I know that this matrix commute. I want two commuting matrices, so as I said, the, the, the course is about commuting, mat commuting diffeomorphism, so I want another commuting diffeomorphism. If this matrix happens to commute, then <coughs> there exists a K integer, which is not zero, such that B is uh, plus or minus a to the k. So it could be minus this matrix, but this is not that much. It means that, uh, of course, an iterate of a diffeomorphism will commute with a diffeomorphism, but this is not really fun. So you are not adding any other guy there. And indeed, you have this exercise, and you can try to go further and prove a similar statement for any matrix in SL to Z. Okay? So if you are in dimension 2, in the torus T2, you will not have two matrices commuting unless one is essentially a power of the other, or have a common power, or essentially have a common power. So, so what we can do is we, we can just go to higher dimensions. So let's go to dimension three. Uh, because, um, well, here I exclude zero because it's obvious that this, uh, I don't want the identity matrix. So, uh, but you're right. I shouldn't exclude zero if I want a, a correct statement here. For this statement, zero is okay. If not, I should say that it's not identity and they have a common power. Thanks. <coughs> okay, so now I take a matrix in SL3Z and I looked as this matrix. So it's three by three integer matrix with determinant one, so I can make it act on the torus, and I have a diffeomorphism of the torus. And, <coughs> well, you will have essentially, depending on what is the matrix, you will have the same picture as this one, but I can make it more delicate explanation of what it happens, and that's what I'm going to do. So I don't want A to be the identity matrix. So identity has very trivial dynamics to discuss. So what you will have always is 
three numbers, which are essentially the modulus of the eigenvalues. So we are in dimension three, so we have these three numbers. And <coughs> you need to do some discussion here, which is yet again some exercise. You may have double eigenvalues, but then they will have, need to have modulus one if it is not diagonalizable. If it is diagonalizable, then this will be one and it's complex conjugate. And still this will not be fun enough. And the nice case is when the three guys are real and different. Okay? So, so the exercise is to formulate correctly what I'm going to write here and solve it. Okay, so unless lambda one positive. Lambda, let me, let me just stay which are the lambda i's. So lambda i are modulus of eigenvalues. Then the statement is less lambda one larger than lambda two is larger than lambda three, lambda i different from one. All of them, we are in a situation like this, or completely non-hyperbolic. So completely non-hyperbolic meaning the eigenvalues are all of modulus one, indeed plus or minus one. So not, not interesting for us. Okay, so we <coughs> So this exercise will tell you that if you really want two commuting guys, you want three real eigenvalues, the three of them of modulus different from one. Okay, so that's the implication. If you have a complex eigenvalue, you need the conjugate, so you will have an equality here. So you need really real eigenvalues there. So there are, there are such matrices. You can find them. It's not too hard. Here is one example, which is yet one more exercise to show that this example works. Take this matrix. It has a terminant one, I hope, and it's, <coughs> eigen, uh, its eigenvalues are all reals. Two are larger than one, and one is between zero and one. Okay, and you have the matrix B. You can put two identity minus A. This will commute with A trivially. It will have the terminant one, and the property, if I make my computations correct, if not, you can try to fix them and find the correct guy. So, property, if a to the k times e to the l is the identity, kl different from the zero, zero, uh, I'm sorry, kl in z, then kl equals to the zero, zero. The only way they <coughs> are a power of the other, and eta, that's absolutely nonsense, now it's better. So, if they have a common power, so to speak, then it's because you are doing the trivial thing. So then I have generally a, a map from C2 to SL3C, which is taking K and L into this power. And what this exercise tell you is that this is a one-to-one -one homomorphism. Well, let's call it raw. <coughs> and then you have two different morphisms of the total T2 that commute with each other. Okay, now. Now, since I have three different eigenvalues here, 
I have a decomposition of R3 as E1 plus E2 plus E3 into the corresponding eigenspaces. And since the eigenvalues are different, you will get that B preserves this same splitting. So it's jointly diagonalizable with, with A, and it's just because it preserves this very same splitting. We have that A of EI is EI, and B of EI is also EI. It means that if I iterate, let's call lambda i of a, the eigenvalues of a, and lambda i of b, the associated eigenvalues of b. So if I consider the this iterate of these matrices on a vector b1 on the direction e1, then what I will get is lambda 1 of a to the power k times lambda 2, lambda 1, oops, of b to the power l times b1. I get multiplied by these numbers. So that's how this guy is acting on this basis. So this is for every b1 and the e1, and the same happens with the e2 and e3. <coughs> now, since these numbers this is yet another exercise. Since these three numbers are real and different from one, you can show that not only this power is never the identity, but also this number here can never be one. Yet another exercise. We are not going to use it right now, but it will show up later, I'm sure. Okay, so since <coughs> these numbers are different from one, you have that you can put together the two numbers which has modulus larger than one, and or if there are two of them, if there is only one of them, you just put it by itself. And the two numbers which are smaller than one, if there are two of them, and you get this splitting, ES plus EU that you want. <coughs> okay, good. So this is the type of examples we want to study. So, well, not this is the linear version. So we want to study the nonlinear version of these guys. Let me move forward and define what are the Lyapunov exponents. In this setting. Okay, so we have this splitting of R3. Well, you can do it in, in whatever dimension you want. I'm just doing three dimensions. Make life of everybody simpler. <coughs> so I have this split into three spaces, and I can define associated functionals from C squared into R, which is chi i of a point in C squared will be the logarithm of the absolute value of lambda 1 to the a to the k times lambda 1 of b. L. So it's the logarithm of the absolute value of the number I am multiplying there on the ei direction. Okay? And this is what is understood as the Lyapunov exponent. In general, when you are lucky and you have eigenvalues, the logarithm of the eigenvalue is the Lyapunov exponent. And here you have this nice eigenvalue on these directions, and the logarithm of the eigenvalues is this Lyapunov. But now the, Lyap the, 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 the Lyapunov exponent is not just a number, it's a function. Because I'm playing with C squared guys, so I have really a function. So let me put here 
my R square, and inside the R square is a C square, of course. <coughs> and I have three functionals. The one corresponding to the first direction, the one corresponding to the second direction, and the one corresponding to the third direction. So I can naturally extend it to the linear map. And then to maps a linear map from R square to R. So just instead of putting KL, you put TS, or allow K and L be real numbers. <coughs> and then I have this linear function. And the linear function is essentially determined by the kernel of it plus some normalization. Okay, here the normalization will show up later, but the kernel is very important for us. No? Kernel of the chi one, say here is the kernel of the chi two, and say here is the kernel of the chi three. Say it again. What is the index of the second line? Uh, it's a one. I. It's also one, yes. So the, 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 the sub index, well, is an i, I'm sorry. This should be an i, and this should be an i. So it's, so the, the, the sub index correspond to the direction on you are applying your dynamics. Okay, in this splitting here, E1, E2, E3. So then, once you have these kernels, another very important information is to which side of the kernel your eigenvalue, your, your Lyapunov exponent is positive or negative. Okay, let's say, uh, I should have done this computation before. So let's say this kernel is positive to this side and negative to this side. Then I hope I can do this second guy positive to this side and negative to this side. Then if I do this, this should be probably negative to this side and positive to this side. Hope this is fine. So the, the very important observation here is chi1 of n, so for every n in c squared, chi1 of n plus chi2 of n plus chi3 of n. Okay, what happened with the sum of these three guys? This is the logarithm of the first eigenvalue plus the logarithm of the second eigenvalue plus the logarithm of the third eigenvalue. So it's the logarithm of the product of the eigenvalues Determinant is one, so the product of eigenvalues is one. So logarithm of one is zero, so the sum of these three guys should be always zero. Which means that if two of them are positive, the third has to be negative. So you cannot have the three of them positive. And I hope I made things in the right way and you cannot have three positive. So a point here where the three guys are positive. Now what happens if you sit in one of these lines? What well, is the kernel? So if this is the chi one, the kernel of the chi, if you are in the kernel of the chi one, it means chi one is zero. Chi one zero means the the eigenvalue is one or has modulus one. Here are real numbers, positive real numbers, say. So if the modulus of the eigenvalues is one, so the guy is one, which shouldn't be possible unless you are irrational. So this means that this line will be totally irrational. Okay, so it's not a rational line. This needs to be proved, but it's yet another exercise. There is no integer point on any of these kernels. It's not that bad. It's, 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 you, you, you can do it. Okay, so these are called, so the, you, you have here determined three different, well, several cones. Let's say, oops, it should go all the way up to here. So these cones with the associated guys. This, these three coins, and these are called veil chambers. <coughs> so whenever you pick an element here, you are getting a lot of information, but in particular, you are getting the information that on who, which direction is unstable and which direction is stable. 
if you are a plus plus minus, so meaning the first is positive, the second is positive, and the third is negative, then you have that the this and this are unstable, and this is the stable guy. Okay, and in this way you can look at into these combinatorics and distinguish what will be the unstable space and what will be the stable space for these guys. Okay. <coughs> so what we do with this? So this is all the linear picture. Now, what we do with the nonlinear picture? So let's discuss a little bit diffeomorphisms of the torus T3 or Tn for that matter. Of a map F, torus Tn to the torus Tn. Okay, a diffeomorphism. It doesn't need to be diffeomorphism, but since we are going to work mostly with diffeomorphism, it could be a homeo, or it could be just a map. It doesn't matter. So some very basic algebraic topology, so it's covering theorems, will tell you that you can lift F tilde, well, F to F tilde, lift, and this F tilde is a map from Rn Rn. So that the natural diagram Here you have the canonical projections. This diagram commute. This leaf is not unique, but let's not worry about the non-uniqueness now. You can put some conditions to make it unique, or you can study what's the non-uniqueness, so it's not really a big deal. Now this leaf will always be of the form Ax plus phi of x where A is an n by n, so I say it's a diffeo, so it's invertible integer matrices, where the inverse is also an integer matrix. Okay, so essentially the determinant is plus or minus one. So integer matrices with determinant plus or minus one. And the phi function satisfy that phi of x plus n is phi of x for every n. So it's Zn periodic function. So you can always write this diffeomorphism, so the lift as a linear guy plus a periodic guy. So being periodic means, in particular, this bounded, okay? while the linear map is a linear map, so it's not bounded at all. So it means that if you look Rn close to infinity, you are moving by a huge linear map, and then you are moving a bounded amount. Okay, so it's a bounded perturbation of a linear map. Okay, so we have always such a lift. So let us assume A is hyperbolic. So it's an of, uh, an of matrix. So it means that Rn can be written as this U and have that the norm of a to the n is less than z lambda to the n, oops, restricted to the stable part, lambda less than one, positive for every n larger than zero, and norm of e n, e minus n in the unstable is less than z lambda to the n, same things, and a of e s is yes, and a of e u, 
is the same as with an also. So the transformation of the torus as it with the linear is an also of diffeomorphism, and there is your splitting. So what can we say about the F? Can we say anything about the F just from these conditions? So this very condition we start with. Indeed, we can say a lot. We can say that F has a fixed point. This is yet another exercise. Proof that F, in this situation where A is hyperbolic, F will have a fixed point. Indeed, you will have a huge amount of periodic orbits also. And indeed, you have a little bit more. This is a theorem by Franks. From Franks, the 70s or 60s, 60s probably, that says that in this framework, there exists H from Tn to Tn, continuous, homotopic to identity. which essentially homotopic to identity means that this matrix that appeared here corresponding to this H is the identity matrix. And such that H composed F is a composed H. So the And the proof indeed is, is so he never called it a theorem, and indeed it's, it's, a, it's a simple computation that we are going to do. Worry. But the point is that this linear map is a factor of F. That's the meaning. It's a topological factor. This being homotopic to the identity implies automatically that the map has to be onto. Well, plus continuous, well, if it is not continuous, it's not homotopic to anything. And it is not hard to prove it in this setting. So what we are trying to discuss then is whether we can make this H better than just a continuous map homotopic to the identity. Okay, so can we make it a homeomorphism? Can we make it a diffeomorphism? <coughs> so proof. So you have contraction and expansion. Let's have this lift AX plus some phi of X. And let's look for H of the form identity plus some U of X, where U of X is the same as u of x plus n for every n. So identity plus periodic. <coughs> so we put the equation. H composed F is a composed H. This is the same as, well, if you, I will do it maybe a little bit faster, you can do as an exercise the slow motion, so this is F plus, you compose F is equals to A plus, let's put H tilde here, <coughs> A compose U, and this is the same as A plus phi plus U compose F is equal to A plus A compose U, so we can cancel out the address is A, and we get a very nice equation, which is phi equals to A compose U minus U compose F. So it's a functional equation, but it's linear in the variable U. So A is a linear map, so this is a linear in the variable U. So I can write down a phi here, goes from Rn to Rn, and the U also is my unknown, go from Rn to Rn, but I can split them since Rn 
let us ES plus U. I can split this Rn as ES plus U, so I can look to phi S from Rn to the ES space and US from Rn to the ES space, and the same thing e, UU and phi U. Okay, I will do just this part, the other part will be exactly the same. So I can put S's here. AS means to the stable part of the A. Let me just multiply this by this vector. Maybe let's remove this, it's not really needed. So this is your functional equation. <coughs> okay, so let's move there and rewrite the functional equation there. Phi S composed F inverse is, with a minus here, is US minus S S U composed F inverse. Okay, so that's the same equation. So how I solve this equation, I can solve it explicitly. If you think that this operator L of US equals to A S US composed F inverse, composing with a map, here in the C0 topology is an isometry, so as soon as this function is onto. And AS is a contraction. So this is a contraction, and what I'm having here is identity minus L times US. So we know how to take the inverse of this guy. So I minus L inverse is sum of L to the K, K larger than or equal to zero. I can just write explicitly the solution, so I will get that US will be minus sum k larger than or equal to zero. I don't want to put this here. A to the k pi s composed f to the k. You can get another exercise. Show that this is a convergent sequence in Z0 topology. Okay, it's the M Weierstrass M test. And you will have analogously that UU is sum K larger than or equal to zero, A to the minus K, UU phi, uh, there should be some minus one somewhere, yes. Here, and this is a plus one here and a K. So this is the formula for the U, essentially. And again, you can check that this is a conversion sequence. And since the function phi s is periodic, the f will preserve the integer lattice. This will also preserve the integer lattice. So you have that this function u s is periodic, this function u u is the n periodic. So there is your solution. That's the proof of the theorem. Now, how to make this H better than just a continuous map? Second theorem, which now is Franks and Manning, and then it's really a hard theorem. I'm not going to prove it. It says that if F is an anosov, from Tn to Tn is an anos of diffio, then H from Tn to Tn doing that is a homeomorphism. So the H we just built is indeed a homeomorphism. So it's one to one. So it was already continuous and onto, now it's one to one. <coughs> so 
So this is very important. It has more than just this piece. This Frank's, oops, Frank's Manning. I didn't wrote Manning. So part of the statement, which we will not care much, is that the matrix A is indeed a hyperbolic matrix. If F is a loss of dimorphism, then the matrix A is indeed a hyperbolic matrix. This is part of the theorem, just not only assuming that. Okay, now comes the next question. Can we make H a diffeomorphism? Even can we make it absolutely continuous, meaning it takes Lebesgue measure zero to Lebesgue measure zero? And the answer to both questions is most of the cases, no. You cannot make these guys not even absolutely continuous. And you can see easily that you cannot make it a diffeomorphism just have that a of zero equals to zero, so zero is the zero vector. And if you look at the formula, you will have h composed f at h minus one of zero is the same as a of zero, so this is the same as zero. So this means that f of h minus one of zero is h minus one of zero. So h minus one of zero is also a fixed point so here I'm using this homeomorphism, so there is such an h minus one of zero. And if you take the derivative of this equation, you will get matrix Q, which is essentially the derivative of h at the h minus one of zero, times the derivative of f at zero is a times Q. It means that these two matrices here and here has to be conjugated. And this is a very strong condition. You can write easily perturbations that will kill this, this property. Most likely, it's not. Now, the theorem <coughs> that still you can do something when you have the two commuting guys. So, this theorem in the very final format is a theorem with C and 1. But I will just state it because I, I will not state the, the precise hypothesis here. So then it's by several authors. Have this um, alpha. Three. <coughs> one to one. So it's two commuting different fission, but not being one a power of the other or some trivial thing. Assume this n naught such that alpha of n naught is an osov. Okay, so it's the f of that theorem. <coughs> then it will be topologically conjugate to the linear map. Now, can we say more? Yes, we can say more. Then, th appears here from Frank's Manning. <coughs> okay, and indeed, This row from C square into SL 3Z, which essentially correspond, well, GL 3C, which essentially correspond to, to the linear part of the corresponding matrices alpha and naught. And if I want to make it correctly, and there exists the gamma the subgroup of C square, the quotient is finite. Find it in the subgroup such that alpha of H compose alpha N is draw of N compose H for every N in the gamma. You know, there are fine guys which are, you cannot make linear. So this is some subtlety, but this is of minor effect. Uh, probably it will appear 
clearly later. Okay, so I guess time is up. So the idea of the next lecture will be to prove this statement, and the next two lectures we are going to, in a sense, apply this theorem to understand more general group acting. Okay, that's it. Thanks.